Magandang hapon po sa inyong lahat. Whether one is a scholar or an academic, a practicing economist or a historian, or just any interest. interested member of society, there are always watershed books for them, books that massively engaged people's interests. These books are called classics. They speak to the mind and its curiosities. They make us understand and appreciate our culture and its many refinements. They tell us stories of how our societies have evolved how our nation was and is built. I'm proud to be part of a university press that has a long list of such classics. And one of them, the 20 year old Making Mindanao, Cotabato and Davao in the formation of the Philippine nation state is now available again. We just reissued a new edition on its 20th anniversary. Rudy Rodil, a known Mindanao activist and historian, in September, just two months ago, found in his files his unpublished review of Making Mindanao, which he wrote way back in 2000. Not knowing we were working on the new edition, he gave it to Minda News for publication. What serendipity? If I may quote an excerpt, reading through Patricio Abenales' work, was like catching two birds with one hand. I learned to appreciate the discipline of the political science at the same time that I discovered many more historical details of immense interest about Mindanao. At certain points in the book, I noticed myself sometimes nodding, smiling, sometimes frowning, sometimes weighed with sadness, and sometimes burning with restrained exasperation. As I read the story of how the settler population and corporate interests crept into Mindanao, first slowly, then as the pace picked up, the creeping became leaps and bounds. Close quotes. Joining Abinales this afternoon are two young scholars on Mindanao. First is Patricia Irene Dapudao, assistant professor at the History Department of Ateneo University, whose recent publication, Empire's Informal Ties, Pioneer Anthropologists in Davao, 1904 to 1916, just came out in Philippine Studies, Historical and Ethnographic Viewpoints, year 2020. Her book on Abaca and the American, and American Colonial Davao is forthcoming from Ateneo Press. The other young scholar is Oliver Charbonneau, a lecturer in American history at the University of Glasgow. His book, Civilizational Imperatives, Americans, Moros, and the Colonial World, just came out from Cornell University Press as part of its United States in the World series. A local edition will be released by Ateneo Press in the first quarter next year. Pat and Oliver will share how making Mindanao had been foundational to their research. Our featured author, Patricio N. Abinales, is professor in the School of Pacific and Asian Studies, University of Hawaii, Manoa. He co-wrote State and Society in the Philippines in 2017 with his late wife, Donna J. Amoroso. His new manuscript, the Philippines Democracy at Death's Door for the Cambridge Elements in Politics and Society in Southeast Asia series is currently under review. For maybe 20 to 25 minutes, Patricio or Giorgio to many of us will address the topic Social Origins of Moro Separatism and Duterteismo. Pat and Oliver will quickly give their reactions and we are, and also we are making sure that the Q&A will be given more time. So that's about 20 minutes. You are therefore encouraged to type in the chat box your questions as they come to you. 
National artist and eminent scholar Resil Mujares calls Jojo one of the indispensable voices in contemporary Philippine scholarship. He describes making Mindanao as theoretically informed, empirically grounded, and trenchantly written. So folks, let's begin. Here is Patricio Nunez Abenales. Uh, thank you very much for everyone for uh, taking time to attend this forum. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to the Philippines. Good morning to Oliver. It's eight o'clock in the evening here. Um gabi, maayong gabi, alaikum, and I hope uh, you guys um, are well. Um, so first and foremost, I'd like to thank everyone for check uh, clicking into uh, this discussion, and I hope. I look forward to your interesting questions. Um, second, I'd like to thank Ateneo, the University Press, and Karina Bulasco and the staff for agreeing to reprint uh, Making Mindanao after somebody from Mindanao said, Wala kaming kopya dito, ah. Saan yung kopya namin? So I said, sure. I ag agreed only if uh, Ateneo Press would bring in some of the chapters that I had to remove uh, in the earlier version of the book because of space and because it was more expensive. So the new book is a, it's an expand it's a it's a you know rerun in a way of the book, but it's added new chapters. Uh, it's brought back two chapters which I really loved uh, writing when I was doing it. Uh, writing it, the dissertation was the life, life political life of Salipada Pendaton and Alejandro Almendras. Um, I also would like to thank Pat. Uh, and Oliver for being here and not agreeing to be my interlocutors. I feel really old after reading their works, uh, Oliver and Pat's books. This, their, their works are fantastic and exceptionally sophist more sophisticated than Making Mindanao. Um, I especially like the idea that the Oliver, who is not American, is writing about the American empire uh, uh, in Mindanao, and Pat, who is not from Manila, in writing about Davao, which nobody else has ever run. So I look forward to the comments. Um, okay, um, so what I'd like to do is, I'm giving myself 15 minutes to introduce myself. Well, some of the people said, well, how did you end up doing the research, okay? So I went to Cornell accidentally in 1988. Um, I finished my dissertation in 1997. Um, my interest in Mindanao was not just uh, academic, it was personal. I grew up in the northern, uh, Mindanao city of Zamis. Uh, you remember the mayor three years ago, um, Parohina was killed. He was my mother's high school student. Um, and then I were, after I graduated the University of the Philippines, I never left UP and worked with the Third World Studies Center uh, under Director Professor Randolph Daviden. And it was that time that uh, the TWS was interested in doing Mindanao studies. So in 1979, we ended up Three, I think three or four months among the banana in the banana plantations of Davao, studying the corporate the impact of corporate agriculture on the Davao countryside, and then I accidentally ended up in Cornell. Uh, I had no intentions of uh, doing my PhD, but you know personal things moved uh, had a way of moving things, so I ended up working, deciding to continue with my PhD. I went there and said to my advisor was Benedict Anderson, and I said, Ben, I want to study the communists and the military. Uh, it was in the 80s, it was a heyday in which uh, the CPP was going, undergoing a lot of intense discussions. The AFP was trying to overthrow Mrs. Aquino, so I thought yeah, that would be very nice. But then, then in spring of 88, in the middle of the winter, uh, I think this is my first preface, he turned to me and said, why don't you study where your family came from? I just realized, I just came to know that you're from Mindanao. And I said, oh, okay. Um, and there were two reasons for that. One is that she thought they found out I was from Mindanao. I spoke Bizayan. And the second thing was that what I completely forgot, I only remember now, was in 80, uh, in the early part of 1989, Ben just got back from the Philippines doing his field work, doing his sort of traveling around the Philippines, uh, showing up, attending uh, peasant rallies in Negros. But also, what he, I forgot to remember from then, I remember now that he got drunk and had beers, which Colonel Franco Kalida, uh, those of you from Mindanao would know who he, who he was. He is the brother of the current Solicitor General, who is running after uh, the opposition. 
but he is almost more famous as the founder of the Alsa Masa. Colonel Kalida was the one who founded Alsa Masa, whose leader, Jun Palo Pala, was somebody who President Duterte bragged of, you know, having gone after. So he had beer, Anderson had beers in Dava with Kalida and talked about it. And I think that was what happened. So we ended up talking about what to do research, of course, you know, like any other 30 year old Mindanao committed to social transformation. I said, I want to study the Communist Party of Mindanao and the MNLF. But as things appeared, you know, once you get into the field, something's changed and that's why I decided to go back to history. Now at this point, I'd like to apologize to Pat and Oliver for the subtitle of this uh, talk. Uh, it's a more contemporary one and I know that they are working on history, okay? So I, I would like to apologize because I thought of adding it for a couple of things. One, I thought it was a sexy title, you know, that the will get uh, <coughs> people to watch it, fine. <clears throat> but second, as I was finishing this current manuscript of mine, I realized that a lot of what we would call the Duterte industry in American, in, in Filipino and in Filipino scholarship, miss two things. One, it does have not have anything to, it doesn't know anything at all about Davos political economy, economy and history. Okay. And second, the assumption that to understand Duterte, one just has to look at how weird and bizarre he was from the perspective of Manila politics. And I said, wait, if I add this in, maybe we can, <clears throat> I can also think, uh, share a couple of ideas on how would we best understand people like Duterte and the Moro National Liberation Front from a Brodelian perspective, from a long, long jury, as I say. Okay, so that's how I ended up. So um, again, so my apologies with Pat, to Pat and Oli Oliver for sort of sidetracking, sidetrack, being sidetracked to this. But let me, in the next 10, 15 minutes, just go over uh, citing, uh, you know, mentioning a couple of things about the um, social origin. So <clears throat> the first thing question I'd like to know then, uh, let me share some view of the screen, is the first, first thing you want to ask, people would ask is how come, uh, how come you got interested in Mindanao? Uh, yeah, what was the approach of your study of Mindanao? Okay, say those. Okay. Okay, so this is the book. You know, now I study basic. I, my my fo area of focus is for those uh, just to familiar. I think this one, the floodlands of Cotabato and the lake of Dava. So the question then: So what kind of methodologies did you use, or were you inspired on to study in the now? I am very much, very much influenced by these four advisors. Uh, the first is, I think all of you are familiar, uh, Benedict Gorman Anderson, this is my daughter. Um, um, ben, as Lolo Ben, or as my, uh, my daughter calls him, um, does very, something very, very interesting when we were in grad school, we took classes with him. First, he, this concept of negative comparison okay, was something that really drew our curiosity. And it revolved and, uh, around five questions. First is, he always asks the question, what is odd about it? Meaning, it's not normal, baby, it's something odd. And so they're gonna start you know, playing with your brain and say, yeah, indeed, what is odd about it? And the second thing he asks is, what is missing? Okay. What is missing? One, one odd example for him is to say, why is it that everybody is laughing in the Noli, but where is the laughter coming from? And Carol Howe, in her essay, uh, which Paul Ateneo Press published, really has a wonderful answer to that. The third thing that was really interesting is that what happened if you shift your lens? So instead of, say, looking at Philippine history, Manila, Mindanao, Mindanao, Manila, okay, or Holo, Singapore, what happened? What happened to the way you understand Philippine history? But the most important, most interesting thing is done was to say, well, if you have the same data in front of you, are, how, can you come up with the opposite conclusion for this? And I was really inspired by this article on studies of the Thai state in the state of Thai studies, where Thai scholars before that as I said, we're unique, Thailand is unique, we're like, we're not, we haven't been colonized, we're like Japan. And then using the same sort of data then said, no, you're not like Japan, you're like the Northern Malay states under British rule, you were neo-colonial uh, 
subalterns of British colonialism. So that sort of got me fascinated then. The second person here is Vivian Xu. She's a scholar in Chinese politics, as and politics. Um, um, she was, she uh, belongs to a tradition associated with Jim Scott, studying peasants. But the interesting thing about her work, which was on how peasants resist the, the Chinese communist state, is a looking at all these internet, looking at all these networks that intermesh with each other to allow these communities to survive transformations done uh, uh, and above. So he, uh, most in Philipp among Filipino political scientists, they always cite uh, Migdal as uh, the classic example of a state and society relationship. Migdal, who is a colleague of Vivian and Atul Cooley, actually between the three of them, I found the works of Atul Cooley who compares the US and India and Vivian Xu, who looks at peasant, China, China state from the perspective of the peasant, interesting. The third one is Takashi Shiraishi. Uh, he was then in his there, a, at the history department at Cornell. Uh, he recruited Carolina Howe and I to, to Kyoto. And um, he um, Takashi worked on Indonesia, Indonesian history and politics. But the one he kept asking me about is in Mindanao, where is the police? Where the, the hell is the police? You know, and so, that's one of the things that I was trying to answer is like, where the heck are the police and the constabulary in Davao and Cotabato? So Takashi has kept pushing me on that. <clears throat> and the last one is Martin Schefter. He is a professor of American political development. The interesting thing about Cornell Department of Government is it's very strong historical focus. Professor Schefter studied the Philippine state, the American state and the political process at the turn of the 20th century. I got interested in it because it was also the time when the progressive movement merged. And one of their students, actually, Stephen Skoronik, who now teaches Yale, wrote this wonderful radical book called The, uh, the Origins of the New National State. Basically, Schefter and company were arguing that, you know, at the 1900, you're not talking of, you're talking of, about a completely different American state. So that sort of framed my questions on the colonial section of the chapter, which is like, so what happened, what was happening in the United States and how did this changes in the mentalities of many state builders in the United States ended up being worked in the Philippines. So these are the four advisors I've had. Um, um, okay, so, what's, uh, so the question then is what is odd about it? I ran a search this afternoon in the UP library to class in the Philippine e-library, and this is what I sort of found. Yes, Mindanao, this is all fields, okay? Mindanao, it comes to the broad islands, the main regions, Mindanao does well. But then once you shift into local, then you have this, okay? This is 2020 today. When you shift to communism, and Mindana communism was very important in Mindanao, you have this, but only 14. On the single biggest conventional war that the Philippine army was involved in after World War II. Okay. Same here. Okay. So I thought generic Filipinos, how many studies on Filipinos and Muslims? Yeah, okay. But then once you go down again, the fascinating thing is this. So this is what I thought was the first, what's odd about understanding in and out. It's marginality, it's lack of importance in national, in Philippine and Philippine studies academia, okay? But if you look at it this way, then there is what is missing, okay? And if you look at it, it's just giving it for data, it's a very huge island. And look at it, we are as big as Korea, Austria, the Czech Republic, Ireland, Netherlands, and Taiwan. We are the island, Mindanao is the eighth most populous island in the world, larger than Taiwan, Syria, Mozambique, etc. If you connect all the top East Coast states, Northeast East Coast state, Mindanao is still far larger. But to add to that, this, this is an island whose sultanates predate even the Philippine nation state. They relating not just within Mindanao itself, but as far up, far up as China and as far west as Islam. So you have on the one hand this, and you have this. Okay. 
So this is the, the sort of broad picture then uh, that led me to start studying Mindanao. And then, then I went more specific and decided to study Cotabato and Davao. I couldn't study Misamis because, you know, the local warlords probably weren't happy if the, 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 the town, townie, the boy, the, the, the town boy wants to spill, spill up the secrets. So I ended up doing Cotabato and Davao precisely because there were the two largest provinces in the Philippines after the early, up to the night, early 60s. The two largest provinces in the Philippines and the least studied. Okay. In the case of Cotabato, I was interested about the Maguindanao. Lots of work on the Taosugs, lots of work on the on, on the on, on the Maranaos, but very, very little in Maguindanao. Uh, Dr. Michael Mastura actually has a thick compendium of a study of the Maguindanao Sultanate, and I'm hoping that the people in Mindanao News are going to publish it soon. So this is what fascinated me, the Maguindanao the largest of but the least studied okay. historically the only book on the beginning now is Rudy Larhoven uh, and uh, Eric Casino and these are actually still you know they're just uh, skimming the surface the second that fascinated me is the Moro Islamic Liberation Front now the MILF has up to now 14,000 armed force within five camps okay and it's, called, it's led by people who fought the war before they went to back to Mindanao. You compare that to the MNLF, MNLF ex uh, uh, emerges in 75, promptly splits in 77. Okay, splits farther into five more. One of the splits was the MILF, and up until the MOA AD, when Arroyo and the MILF tried to ram a, a, an agreement, the MILF has been intact. What accounts for this? But it's weird. Thing was this for me. It was an Islamic organization. It critiqued the MNLF for being uh, being too Republican and too Marxist. And yet, in 2004, Hashim Salama writes a letter to President George W. Bush and says, "Hey, can you mediate between us and the Philippine government?" Okay. The third one was this. Uh, there are very few Muslim in the Salipada Pindaton. Um, like Ompong Rodel, I grew up hearing about him, the only, the first most articulate Muslim uh, senator, uh, powerful congressman, uh, who actually um, survived, you know, uh, all these changes, well, gradually he lost his power, but, you know, was one of the outstanding Maguindana politicians of his time. Right. And then from there, I sort of started to look at what interesting about Cotabaro, and I found this, okay. That essentially the imperial province of Cotabato, unlike Davao, which I will go next, is a subsistence economy. It's a marshland. Okay, it's flat. But because of this, it is also a flat land, an area where there is a strong Maguindanao community with a strong history. You know, Sultan Kudrat, Datu Piang, Datu Uto. These are communities that had had long political histories okay but in the 19th after the war one thing i noticed was that it also became the target of a vast autonomous you know movement of people from the center to the northern and the southern northern Philippines into the south it was one of the target areas such that as time went on these communities and these communities started to define their own boundaries okay uh, I remember in 2008 when uh, Professor Rufa Giam and I were trying to visit the Ampatuan, Ampatuan's town. Uh, <coughs> it was actually, we had to cross a river and the people would say, yeah, once you cross that river, you're out of Ilongo territory, you're in Maguindanao territory. Okay, so this was an area then that got me interested because the question then if this was the imperial province, how did, how was politics conducted? Okay. So I began to look at the role of Pindaton, and then I realized that he actually was really a broker. He was a broker in the sense of trying to establish peace. The book that talks about establishing the peace between the two communities, but also with Pindaton selling the moral votes to the nation. And so that's one of my, the things that I'm arguing, which is, you know, when it came, part of the reason why Cotabato until the 1960s was relatively peaceful, was that people, uh, its politicians, could offer the moral vote there. 
Okay. There was a weak national state presence. I would have uh, in one of the tables, actually I counted how many units of the constabulary were there uh, as per Takashi's advice. And, you know, it's like <coughs> the PC and the police were completely outnumbered by the people there. Now, the break point was, of course, in the 60s when Marcos intervenes and creates, implements the second national development plan for Mindanao. Uh, Pendaton declines, as I talked in the book. Uh, prompting his relatives, his allies to form a Muslim independent movement arising from the conflict between these two. Okay. And the Muslim independence movement reaches out to a bunch of UP graduates and graduates from Egypt Al Azhar University, both educated in nationalism, uh, tries to start organizing the Moros, the Maginanaos. The Christian sectors responded by creating their own anti-Muslim militia, the Lagas, and this began in the late 60s and the 70s. Maguindana, Cotabato, actually was one of the areas where the most, the most brutal of atrocities committed, especially against Muslim communities, happened. And what, uh, what turned uh, was more separatism then eventually became, became more powerful when Libya and Malaysia came in. Uh, when Libya provided guns to toilet paper to, to, to the MNLF and Malaysia training camps and flying in arms from Sabah. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so the consequences of this was the tension between these two communities led to the best, the most effective way of minimizing, mitigating the conflict, you create different provinces. So southern Cotabato, Maguindanao, northern Cotabato, the histories of this are in partly the efforts of political clans to take over the region, but also to mitigate the conflict between the two. Raising for therefore to the emergence of not these kinds of strong men, not just a pendaton, but strong men, from the Apatuans to the sector strong men, okay? the general Cahelos, or the Colonel Cahelos of southern uh, of, of southern uh, Cotabato. Uh, uh, the Antoninos, that uh, uh, who, be, who was the political family that ran Southern Cotabato until Manny Pacquiao came out. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this one, their role was partly the result of a war economy. Okay? One of the things that really not studied is to look at Cotabato really as the region as the product of war. And Pancho Lara and uh, Steve Schoff, the international alert people, are zooming in that and Pancho Lara's book on the relationship between clans, insurgents, and drugs is actually one of the so far best uh, studies of this. It radicalized, this one radicalized, led to the radicalization of Al Al Shpurad. This genocide in Kazabata was real, but it also laid the, the war economy laid the foundation of this at the same time as corporate agriculture began to expand. Okay, so this was sort of like. As you track it, the book tracks this, emer this emergence from here to here to try to explain why uh, Islam, uh, Muslim separatism came out. Okay, I'll be fast here. In the case of Dawah, this is an interesting thing, and I encourage you to read Pat Dakuda's dissertation. Because what's odd about Dawah is from the Manila perspective, it is a local, it's a local, it's a provincia, etc. But it's not located, it's not linked to Manila. Its look, its connections, as Pat beautifully pointed out, is with global capitalism. Okay. But from the perspective of the nation, Dava was the frontier. The French were everybody, you know, everybody has to be thrown there. You know, every settler, every peasant looking for lands in the Visayas and Luzon have to go there. Okay. So it's the dark area, it's the border remote. But again, the oddity is that Dava ever since the turn of the 20th century, even very far back, has always been connected to global capitalism. There's a chapter in Pat's book, a section of Pat's book, that talks about Abaca, and basically argues that, no, Abaca wasn't just American, it was going back as far as the Spanish era. And in fact, discussions over the price of Abaca had something to do with, you know, the ups and downs of the market in London and New York. Second was, and this is again what Pat is pointing out, is that in the imagination of Americans then, Davao was not a just a Philippine frontier. It was the last Western frontier. That's why 
the argument I, that I raised and in fact really, really moved forward with it and rendered a more sophisticated analysis is that the best way to look at Davao is the extension of California or New Mexico or Seattle, okay? The third thing is this. Davao Kuo, uh, as people would know now, there were 18,000 Japanese until World War II, uh, under World War II. What were 18,000 Japanese doing there? They were running the hemp, competing with the Americans and the Filipinos, and those 18,000 Japanese were working on a plant, on a hemp plantation, that is again tied to the global market. But what I found, what, what I think was interesting about Pat's work is that the Davao community, in most cases around Southeast Asia, Chinese, Malays, Indians, especially those run under the British colonial powers, never talked to each other, okay? They were plural society, uh, as William Skinner spot them. But in Davao, as, uh, going by Pat's dissertation, no, they were, they, they talked to each other. They were, that's why there's this thing called Davao Tagalog, which disappeared, um, where these different communities sought, because of their interesting connection to Abaca and hemp, defended the community even against efforts by Manila to say the Japanese are spies. There's a Japanese problem there. Okay, so this is the first thing that I found out about Davao. And up to now, Davao is really a regional economy that revolves around export crops, which means then the kind of relationship is capitalist. It's not semi-feudal. It's not even, you know, it's not even feudal. Okay. The second thing that's worth mentioning is that unlike Dakota Bato, the Luma, the indigenous communities were not armed. They had no strong history as the Maguindanaos and the Taosugs. That's why it was easy then for the Visayans from Cebu, uh, or from the Visayan Islands to start moving in and occupying the region. And therefore, this role of political brokers there was not between the Lumad, but among settlers. So in the chapter, I was able, Ateneo was able, uh, happy, uh, you know, I'm so grateful Ateneo that they brought back the story of Alejandro Almendras one of the least known but extremely popular political leaders of his time. He was provincial governor of Davao before moving from the now. He's related to the Duranos. He becomes senator in 1959. Okay. The other one is Pendaton. But Pendaton disappears from the political scene, becomes goes to Congress, and eventually becomes a governor. As his power weakens, Almendras moves on. In fact, when Marshall was declared, he was a cabinet, he was a member of the cabinet, and rumored to be the next, the vice president of Marcos, if Marcos were allowed to run for a third term. So Almendras is one of the least studied people, the uh, people, politicians in Philippine society. But this is also the guy who is responsible for this. And this is what I'm trying to argue that when you we talk about the sign votes, okay, as we talk about the 30 now, we're not just talking about Mindanao votes. You're actually talking of a Visayan domain which includes central and western parts of western Visayas and eastern Visayas, going down Visamis, my hometown, Zamboanga, uh, Oro, Visamis, Oriental, Butuan, Trigao, down to Davao. This is actually what the Visayan vote is all about. And if you want to think about the third day, you cannot just think about Visayan per se, Mindanao, but this huge you know, domain of Visayan vote that Almendras used to keep himself in power and which enabled force Marcos, that force actually convinced Marcos to invest in Melendras basically because of that. Now, the break point was in the 60s, because again, Marcos develops, starts to develop in the now, also tries to displace uh, Muslim rulers, uh, Muslim uh, political elites. But <clears throat> the other thing that's worth exploring and what is really explored in this is the emergence of the theology of liberation, okay? Ed de la Torre was a good articulate theolo uh, uh, ideologue of the uh, explanation, uh, explainer of the theory, but the kind of se solid, serious, systematic organizing in the name of radical theology was in Mindanao. I'm talking about the Marinos, the Jesuits, the, not the Jesuits, there were moderate reformists, uh, <laughs> the, 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 the Columbans, the Redemptorists, such that the Mindanao uh, Pastoral Council was one of the strongest radical uh, uh, pastoral movements in in Mindanao then. There was also something that hasn't been studied is the spillover of the Manila War. As I said, Libya and Malaysia were dumping guns and different kinds of supply into the war effort. And over, I suspect, and somebody has to study this, 
maybe Pancho, it's some of that spilled over Mindanao, providing then the Communist Party's Mindanao Commission. Okay. I think the most dynamic of the time, the most also the most creative and most heretical of that uh, period. Uh, Joma Season hates them for that, to become the strongest of them all, the strongest regional body of the organization. But the, the violence was so intense that it also led to chaos. The you know, the 1987-88 since uh per killing, purging, and torturing of cadres by their own comrades in most of Mindanao. Okay. So the, given this, then you have this tension going on. Well, several consequences. One, the export sector eventually said, we have to trade again. This cannot continue. Okay. One result of that was the creation of Alpha Masa, but the Alpha Masa also became involved in the illicit trade, which is bad for the export business. Second was the emergence of the middle class in the 80s. And this is something that people tend to forget. Even if the economy was in crisis, the middle class was actually going because OFWs were starting to send money then. So Philippine Mindanao, <coughs> especially Davao middle classes, were saying, enough of this, we need it under control. And here's the final point. How do you control that? Well, we had a history of that in the city. This guy, Luis Santos, former hook commander, sent by the hooks in the 50s to expand the PK, the Partido Comunista in the Filipinas, into the south, decides to become a, a city policeman, that was city policeman, imposes his iron will, becomes mayor, okay, and runs it like the way the current president ran it. So for most of the Davaoenos, there was history there. <coughs> and, in, and the demand for uh, stability then enabled someone like Duterte to emerge, which then brings me down my apologies to everybody back to history okay. um and so with that i sort of end and how did they end up doing history um i don't know uh you just i'm a historian so i'll stop there and let pat and oliver come in uh, i hope this you know, if you have more questions you can ask later thank you um who else seniority okay so that's that's the story behind making me now the colonial era is the weakest for me. The, the section on the book is the weakest, in part simply because I ran out of money to do research at the time. There was no, you know, photocopy. You have to, uh, the archive, the US archive, you have to write down your notes. You cannot, you, you know, photocopying was expensive. You had not much money there. So I ended, I, you know, the, the, it was wonderful to get to read Pat and Oliver's work and say, damn it, if I had you know, time and money, I could have covered it, but you know, I was poor, deprived, and oppressed at the time. And and so I had to finish uh, the book, and I was about to write my 16th chapter, and then my late wife said, if you write chapter 16, I will divorce you. And so that's it, that's how the dissertation ended, and making Mindanao came to be. Thank you. Apologies for talking much. Okay, so uh, how do we do this? Uh, Oliver, Pat? Pat, do you wanna do you wanna start it off? Yeah, Pat. I'll I'll mute myself. Okay, so they said I have I'll be the first <laughs> before Oliver. Okay, um, thank you very much, Rodro, for that uh, very. Um, educational and uh, full of information uh, opener and I think I, I was uh, educated once more on uh, the history of Mindanao, Davao and Cotabato especially after the um, the Second World War because my, my study stopped with uh, with the onset of the Second World War in the Philippines um well when karina um asked me if i'd like to be in a conversation with oliver and Jojo um for the 20th anniversary of uh, making mindanao uh, i did not hesitate to say yes because this book of Jojo, when it first came out in 2000 was really instrumental in helping my research uh, take form 
I was uh, doing my master's in Ateneo uh, history department uh, when the book came out. And um, and Father Arcelia was, uh, I was taking up classes of the Jesuits in Mindanao with Father Arcelia during the uh, the Spanish period, the late 19th century. So it was quite um, um, good timing that uh, uh, Jojo will come up with the book that uh, continues uh, the Mindanao story, especially the Davao story uh, when the Americans came. And right away when I was reading the book, the concept of the frontier really caught my imagination because growing up in Davao, the wide open spaces in Davao, um, it does um, give you that um, aspect and helps you understand how um, these Americans who were coming from their own frontier experience in the continental west of the United States um, transferred that same spirit and energy to uh, the Philippines, especially in the wide open spaces of Davao. No? Uh, Davao was the last to be, you could say, conquered uh, or settled by Spain with Oyangoren only in 1848. So, so that was, uh, yeah, the frontier concept really uh, got my imagination going, uh, the historical imagination, as they say. And and I, I tried to think more about that, uh, the frontier concept, uh, the low population density of the uh, Davao at that time. And, um, and coincidentally also, while I was doing my MA, and my MA actually took quite a long time to finish, actually I, I I did my PhD faster than my MA, but uh, I was taking my time and enjoying it. Um, Jodro's um, donation of his uh, research materials to our Rizal Library's Filipiniana um, section, and it was uh, handled by Susan Pador, who was very helpful, um, helped me no? um, get to know more about primary sources on Davao because well, having grown up in Davao, um, we, I, I was never taught the history of Davao or Mindanao, no, in in the elementary and high school textbooks, and even in college in our uh, Philippine history uh, classes, uh, there was only a slight mention of Mindanao. So looking at those sources and uh, having uh, a book written on Mindanao especially Davao, uh, really uh, excited me. And of course, um, I will also have to mention um, the thesis, also in the Filipiniana section of the Rizal Library, the thesis, um, a copy of the thesis of Shinzo Hayase. In, uh, he, he finished that under uh, James Warren in Murdoch University uh, in 1984. And that was the same thesis when I myself was doing my PhD in Murdoch under Jim Warren, that was also my <laughs> the one beside my computer desk. So it was like a conversation I had with Shinzo Hayase and Jodro's books uh, that uh, I had while I was writing my own uh, my own take on Davao. And um, so my, my 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 thesis or my as what they call in the U.S. and in the Philippines, the dissertation, which is now uh, under, uh, yeah, I, 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 it's going to be published by uh, Ateneo Press, um, is actually, I, I consider it a celebration of Davao, of Davao's history. Um, there were the multinational, multicultural peoples there interacting with each other. Uh, they created this hybrid culture, which, um, I feel should be celebrated as well. No, we always hear about problems of Mindanao. In fact, in the 1930s, and I did my MA on that. They, it, Davao was in the national news because of this so-called Davao problem, which is related to the uh, lands and the Japanese supposedly um, um, owning these lands. But so that was also a, a question and and an issue I I, I, I research on for my 
MA thesis. And so Davo always had this um if you could say bad press in the national in the national um story or in the national imagination, which um was not the same stories I hear growing up in the dining tables when when my extended family and we're such a big family, you know, when relatives will talk about the old days. Um and this uh, their stories were one of like this again that that frontier story of pioneers working hard in the uh in the jungles of davao and uh and, and trying to create something out of it and they would also tell me stories of the many friends they made with the tribal peoples uh um, that they meet, no, and of course the Japanese that they they also had uh, done business with. So, so that's what prompted me to write my my book. It's about the the rich uh, interaction, this this creation of uh, a new culture uh, occurring in Davao um, during that that time, no, that that uh, American colonial period. So. I guess uh, I could stop now and uh, uh, give the floor to Oliver. Thanks, Pat. Um, wow, so I'm, I'm so honored to, to be here to, to discuss um, this wonderful book, which is uh, rightfully uh, seeing uh, another uh, new edition uh, for its 20th anniversary. Um, uh, and and want to thank um, Karina for hosting, uh, Mikey and Elmira for um, sort of doing all the technical details for us, and and of course Jojo and, and Pat uh, for for joining me in conversation. Um, so my trajectory is is a little bit different uh, in that I you know I'm something of an interloper here. Um, my my background is is in American foreign relations and, and training is in American foreign relations. Um, and I hope you know just to talk a little bit about how this this book has had an influence, Jojo's books had an influence on me. Um, you know might illustrate uh, its its sort of real cross disciplinary uh, impact. Uh, so when I had when I had started my PhD, I went to a, a school in in southwestern Ontario in Canada. So I wasn't um, at one of these sort of big Southeast Asian uh, research centers in, in, in the states. Um, you know, my supervisor had, had I'd wanted to work on on the United States and the Muslim world, uh, and my supervisor had had suggested you know this is a this is a really sort of understudied area in, in American history this this relational history of of uh, American Moros and, and Lumad uh, in in Mindanao and, and the Sulu Archipelago as well, and maybe you should take a look at that. Uh, so when I went went to start sort of poking around uh, for material on it that had been had been you know written. Um, within American history, uh, I found very little, right? Uh, most of the books uh, written uh, on on the Southern Philippines uh, in relation to the American colonial period, um, at least within the United States, uh, were sort of operational histories of military campaigns. Um, uh, a lot of them presented this sort of homogenous vision of, of a Moro war uh, that didn't take sort of local uh, contextual specificities in, in Mindanao and Sulu and into uh, into account um, and and just they're sort of all of nearly all of them ended at at, at around 1913 1914 um, with with the the folding of the Moro province and, and Filipinization that was going on at that time um, so I was, I was sort of nosing around looking in, in other sort of libraries uh, databases and, and came across uh, Jojo's book. Now, we didn't have it at our library because uh, our library uh, uh, was more split between uh, Canadian and American history. Uh, so I, I ordered up a copy of it. Uh, but in the meantime, I, I tracked down his, his Cornell dissertation, which I think to this day is the, the longest dissertation that I've read uh, cover to end. It was about 600 pages. Um, and that was really sort of my introduction um, to Mindanao, sort of not just um, as as a space where the United States sort of enacted their colonial designs, uh, but really as this as this um, regionally you know regionally diverse and heterogeneous space uh, that also had all of these 
sort of incredible connections, um, you know, not only to uh, uh, U.S. history, but to uh, the history of the Philippine Islands, the history of island Southeast Asia, uh, uh, the history of commerce uh, in, in, in Southeast and East Asia, uh, and the history of, you know, sort of the late imperial world as well. Um, like, like Pat, my study goes up to the Second World War. Um, so these are some of the things that I'm, I'm really interested in. Um, and so finding, finding Making Mindanao at this sort of early stage in my pro uh, project um, sort of really helped, helped me expand um, the scope of, of, of my vision uh, for that project and, and sort of problematized my um, rel relatively sort of straightforward um, uh, Americanist views uh, of, of Mindanao. Uh, as it related um, to not only uh, the United States uh, but the Philippines as well. Um, in terms of in terms of sort of the impact of the book and and, and Jojo uh, being all too modest uh, didn't didn't brag enough about his, his book uh, in his talk uh, which, he, which he should have so uh, maybe I'll I'll sort of uh, signpost some of the things I think are, are really important about it. Um, it was the first serious attempt to reconcile story of nation and empire sort of in this interactive way in, in the Southern Philippines um, and to, to illustrate uh, the mutually constituting forces of state, uh, lo locality and, and empire and sort of show all of the, the hostilities and schisms, but also sort of accommodations and selective collaborations that were going on. Um, and, you know, beyond, beyond as, as he says in the book, this binary of, of resistance and collaboration show how local actors uh, negotiated um, some of these sort of uh, national and, and imperial forces uh, in really sort of selective and, and shifting ways. You know, um, the the story that that Jojo tells in making Mindanao is is really a complex one, and I think it 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 you know, while being theoretically sophisticated, it also does a really good job of showing sort of how people negotiated state formation, both at, at a sort of imperial level and and then a, and a national one as well. Um, it also foregrounds peripheries, uh, uh, or maybe we shouldn't call them peripheries, maybe we could call them peripheralized spaces uh, in state formation, um, and, and shows how Mindanao is really crucial at this, at this sort of nexus of, of colonial state building um, in, in, you know, from, from you know, around 1900 until the Second World War, and, and all of the incipient and growing nationalist uh, movements and, and involvement uh, in, in the South. Um, and it shows how the homogenizing tendencies of the nation, uh, you know, building on on his own uh, supervisor's work, uh, are complicated and, and refracted uh, by the complexities of governance in a multi-ethnic polity. Um, crucially, I think it, it avoids nationalist assumptions about the character of moral responses uh, to the hegemonic designs of both Americans and Filipinos. Uh, and as I, as I mentioned, it sort of shows them as groups that had mutable strategies uh, for staking their places, uh, both within in the empire and, and nation. Um, it does, I think, in other words, uh, what uh, uh, most good scholarship does in that, in that it sort of complicates uh, these patent sort of historical narratives uh, about how things came to be uh, in, in a way that, you know, I haven't even sort of totally come to grips with in, in, my, in my own writing and, and having the pleasure of, of rereading uh, the new edition of this book, the expanded edition, which uh, includes some of the material from that dissertation um, uh, uh, this past week, you know, reminds me just sort of how uh, current uh, the book feels and how relevant uh, it really still is and and um, why it's it's so deserving of of this uh, new edition. Um, beyond that, I mean, I think we should also sort of point out here, and and this applies to most of of uh, Jojo's writing, um, uh, not just this book, but but in the other uh, you know voluminous amount of of other work that he's done. It's it's you know incredibly read readable and at points funny and it's stylistically playful um, and it's you know just a, a real treat to read which I think. Uh, for those of us who who spend our days reading academic texts, and, and hopefully mine doesn't fall into this description, um, you know that's that's not always the case. Uh, and so, um, I just I think you know want to uh, really sort of signal um, what a, what a great work this is. And, and for those of you who who haven't encountered it yet, uh, who are thinking about reading more in Mindanao, I mean this this really is the place to start. Uh, and after that. Um, uh, go seek out uh, uh, Pat's incredible dissertation, uh, which uh, was uh, another Mindanao dissertation that I that I really loved as well, and 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 check that out too.
I think I'll leave it there so we can uh, we can open up the floor for for comments and questions. Well, just a quick point is that with the exception of Michael Hawkins, the best scholarship on Mindanao now have been written have, have been written by non-Americans, which is really a delight for me. Someone from Davao, somebody from Canada. Um, Mike Hawkins is the exception, okay, but, but other, and then a couple of scholars from Germany and Fra and Belgium, you know, Jeroen Adams looking at um, uh, Muslim strongmen, uh, Pancho Lara looking at uh, uh, strongmen in Italy, uh, you know, Filipino studying in England and the US, which I think is, makes the study of Mindanao more fascinating and more fun. No Tagalog yet has studied Mindanao in the same way as uh, scholarship now. So it's also nice to know that most of the scholarship are coming from the region itself. Mark Chiu, Pat Dakudao, uh, Rufa Gia, um, and Michael Mastura, Hompong uh, Rodial. Dato Michael Mastura is revising his 18, you know, Maginda National History. So that's gonna be fun. Yeah, and his work on 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 Maginda now history was, as you say, um, when I was working on on my own project, um, the only sort of really detailed thing that I I could I could track down. It's it's superb. And it's too bad that Ernesto Corsino passed away, hiding Gloria to about scholars. Anyway, uh, questions? No questions yet. So uh, Oliver. Uh, what makes your scholarship different from the Americans? <laughs> you <laughs> warned me. You warned me. You're you're gonna ask this. Um, I mean, I don't. I, I, I don't. I don't want to to sort of uh, uh, you know put too fine of a point on on differentiation here because uh, you know I I welcome uh, you know all scholarship. Um, I, I suppose. I mean, I was I was trained um, uh, in Canada, obviously, but I was trained by a German scholar um, uh, of of U.S. history, but who is who is also sort of deeply invested in um, sort of cross colonial connections and 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 global imperialism, uh, you know, as as it existed in the late nineteenth and early twentieth centuries. Um, so, I mean, to my mind, I you know, I didn't perhaps. Um, Start out with with uh, as many of the nationalist assumptions about about U.S. history as as I think um, some people are raised with in, in the United States. So I mean, to me, you know, this this whole idea of the United States as an exceptional empire that was doing something different, um, you know, it didn't really put you know, they didn't really hold much water for me from day one. Uh, and, and so to me, you know, when I when I started looking at uh, the history of of, of uh, you know U.S. and Mindanao and, and Sulu. Um, I was you know, immediately sort of interested in, in kind of what that what that told us about the United States, you know, relative to to other imperial powers at the time, and, and how um, their rule in in Mindanao and Sulu was was sort of you know shaped uh, by some of those relationships with um, European and Ottoman and Japanese empires. These things, um, you know, perhaps I mean the answer is is that you know you grow up in Canada, um, you're your 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 view of the United States, you're always sort of aware of uh, it's it's um, sometimes you know uh, overbearing role in the world. You don't have to unlearn, you don't have to unlearn a sort of uh, that particular sort of patriotic nationalist narrative. Yeah, in your case, Pat, though, your dissertation gives a more nuanced picture of Americans. No, Pat. I mean, the women, uh, Metcalf, uh, the women who settled in Davao. Uh, the kind of conversation they had with Syrians, the Japanese, and the the science, uh, you know, uh, how different. I mean, what is you know, uh, what made you think? Yeah, it's much more complicated than that, baby. You know. Yeah, Pat. There might be a little bit of a voice voice uh, break. Okay. Yeah. Pat. Oh. Maybe Pat. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, as historians, we are um, we tell our stories through the sources. No. Uh, can is it uh, working well? As historians, we tell our stories through our sources. Mm -hmm. Am I working well? Yeah. 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 
as historians, we tell our stories through our sources and uh, the Metcalfs, um, Laura Watson Benedict, and uh, Pete Cooper Coles uh, sojourn in Davao in the early decades of the 20th century uh, was a rich trove of uh, information no? because their, um, their notes, their letters, um, correspondences are um, like Laura Watson Benedict and Pay Cooper Cole's uh, papers are in the Field Museum, while uh, Smithsonian has the Metcalf's uh, photographs and some of their letters. So uh, it's it's a good way to uh, look at the people who were there in Davao at that time. Um, from these uh, extant sources we can find from from these um, American institutions, you no know, repositories. So uh, I, I was uh, able to uh, work on that uh, based on the on the availability of the sources. Well, yeah, in my case, actually, it was Ben Anderson who said, uh, "Look at the conversation within the Americans and the Muslims." Datu Mandi spoke what? Datu Mandi spoke what? Six, seven languages. Robert Bates was like some hick from the center, <laughs> Midwest. And so the idea is like, you know, why is it that we look at the empires like this imposing on it? When in fact they were not, they were like this. You know? If you look at them, you know, that's the shifting I get that Ben was suggesting. If you shift it like that, then there's not, you know, you will see that a sophisticated uh, Datu, Sultan of Sulu, much more sophisticated, has a house in Singapore, understands the world better, than a colonel, a captain from the Minnesota Expeditionary Army. Uh, so he said it was that formation, it's like not just like institutions, it's also these people. So in a way, the way to demystify empires is to say, you know, these are all provincial hicks going to the Philippines, knowing nothing about the Philippines, thinking Moros are, you know, uh, a bunch of savages and encountering people who speak six or seven languages, prompting actually even Finley to go back, you know, in the first book. So go back and study empire. Okay. Uh, so I think, you know, one of the things, I mean, what make it, I mean, you're right, Oliver, academics are always so serious. Uh, ben was telling me one time, like, we should write something funny. And how do you make something funny? You make fun of those in power. And that was how the sort of chapter on that to Piang, I played with it because, you know, it really showed that that to Piang just was running over and running around the Americans. And the Americans had no choice, um, and the, you know there there are Americans. There are Americans. Leonard Woods went to Harvard. Finley was uh, from the East Coast, but the rest of other people were like you know uh, rural people from you know maybe Osama City. You know, suddenly jumped into, uh, sent into the Philippines and knowing nothing about the Philippines, but also knowing nothing about American history. Actually, so it is funny to look at how. Um, this is what I complain about American uh, approaches to empire, which is just to look at it this way. It's like it's a whole bunch of, you know, educated louts. But they're not, you know, the educated louts are, the, the more educated ones are actually the Muslims, Visayan, you know, Rizal, uh, Babini. So, so that's what sort of goaded me to sort of make this a very funny book in a way to write. We have a we have a couple of questions here. It looks like um, um, uh, uh, pertaining to sort of uh, Mindanao Mindanao history and and, and contemporary uh, uh, Philippines politics. Um, the first one is: Has the Duterte presidency generated greater academic interest in Mindanao, Jojo? No, unfortunately, the Duterte industry, with the exception of one scholar in Davao, uh, I forgot the name. But he associates, he, he went to the other side and says to her, he's really a happy uh, and that the Mandalayans can understand him. But there's really, Even, yeah, most of the st stories are actually, there's an absence of history in the study of the third day. Um, in part because there's nothing very little written about Mindanao in the top schools of the country, no? Tineo, or Lasalle, UP. So, so yeah, that's my take at least. Pat. Pat, Pat, I think you had something to say there. Pat. Thank you. 
Oh, we, we must be need to be dealing with some some video lag here. Um, uh, Let me just add something, which is if you look at some of the works on the Duterte, okay, hardly cite anybody from Davao. Very very few local sources. Very few local sources written in the dialect. Okay, people complain that it's crass, it's, it's vulgar, but there's really no effort to say what well, what it you know. In my case, for example, the way he curses is like how my aunts curse. Curse. Okay, those of you who are from the province know that these are politicians curse, and there's very little of that sort of sensitivity to these kinds of sources, right or wrong. You know, he's bad, he's you know evil, etc. But there has to be some respect and sensitivity to this kind of local voices to understand a local strongman. And, and that's what I like about your book, Oliver and Pat, because you really a lot time for local voices to come up. Which in the case of the 30 studies, you know, you range from somebody theorizing that it's a populist, you know, wave across the world to, you know, uh, he, he's, he's unique because he speaks like this. No history at all. We have a question here from Riv, uh, Riv Ryla. Um, uh, Professor Abinalis mentioned about settler politics. Uh, were the settlers armed in, in Davao and other parts of Mindanao by the colonial and subsequent governments? Mm. So in, in that case, I think he's, you know, he's, he's, he's referring to sort of uh, you know, the, the, the rise of these you know, settler strongmen in the post-World War II era, maybe. Wait, I, mean, I think Marcos, the era of early parts of Marcos, when Caracas realized that part of his, I mean, he's a developmentalist in his life, you know, you know, plays a crucial role in any national development plan that I'm going to implement. That's when he decided that it was important to move contemporary forces, start expanding local army units, but also to sponsor the political, political ambitions of a couple of contemporary generals. And that's where the plan started to come in. I think, you know, Anchulara probably knows more about this. I mean, in 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 the colonial era. Uh, well, yeah, no, no, Oliver. If we want to, yeah, if you want to go all the way back to, to sort of the, the first decades of the 20th century and, and think about armed armed settlers, I mean, I suppose you know the, the sort of nascent white settler movement that um, that that Pat writes so much about um, that that ends up collapsing. I mean, they're. Um, they're certainly they're certainly armed and have a relationship with uh, with uh, the, the colonial authorities, right? Because you know, for, especially for the first decade and a half of the 20th century, Mindanao is uh, being run effectively by the by the U.S. military. Um, so they you know they do have some firepower behind them. Um, I haven't seen uh, as much about um, um, uh, the settlers from the from the northern islands who who sort of. Um, Come down, you know, start coming down in greater numbers after them, and in the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, I don't, I don't know about, um, you know, whether or not they were armed by the government or not. Uh, Pat might be able to speak to that. Pat, uh, where are the Muslim, non-Muslim indigenous people like the fit in your studies? Um, the prof from Professor Rasilis, um, where are the non-Muslim indigenous people like the right fit in your studies? Um, he did not fit in my studies, Professor Rosales. I apologize. Uh, partly because I was running out of time and I was going to chapter 14. But uh, I also realized two things. One was um, to go into the Luma, the, the, the non Muslim Indian community, was something that you have to have, you have to have anthropological skills, the skills of historical. Um, what? Yeah, but. So, oh, um, yeah, so I decided early on that uh, the Tidurai was a, a community that I was in a position to study. Um, um, I, think, I guess partly also influenced by the fact that I had the MNLF and the Communist Party at the back of my mind in trying to understand state formation. Um, in in Mindanao. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it, I I'll sort of echo what Jojo is saying here, and and that um, 
you know, the, the story of the Lumad in the first half of the 20th century uh, uh, during the American period and under Philipp Philippinization um, remains largely unwritten. Um, you know, my book uh, deals, um, you know, slightly with, with, with Luma, but almost entirely with, with uh, U.S. moral relations, um, simply for the, for the reasons that Jojo uh, points out. I think uh, in many ways, you know, this is uh, uh, an area that, that uh, anthropologists and, and people who have sort of more uh, extensive experience in, in sort of ethnographic field work uh, are, are better equipped to do. So um, I'm looking forward to, to whoever uh, uh, writes that, that book. I mean, that's, that's a, a huge gap in the literature. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, the the student just here uh, just finished the first dissertation on the Sabanan language. She just finished here now, and this is 2020. So it gives, the, it gives you an idea of how shallow the database is still at the moment, and maybe the next generation of scholars from in and out do that. Yeah, I mean, some of the stuff that I was digging up was was stuff, you know, produced by like U.S. colonials, like John John Finley's book, right, on the Suvenon, right? Like you can still find a copy of that, but of course, it's it's written by a district governor of Zamboanga for the you know the Moro province. So, um, um, yeah, hopefully, I know I know one or two people who are who are kind of doing some some preliminary work uh, towards this. So hopefully, we start seeing more uh, soon. That. That. Pat, your turn. <laughs> Just, yeah. <laughs> um, Pat, can you say? Okay, just a quick response to Tina uh, about um, for given all that has happened in the last four years, Duterte, Marawi, BRMM, what aspects of Mindanao? In the new Imperial Manila Dabo. Yes, then. what was the question yeah, again? Yeah. Sorry, uh, I, I, my connection is uh, problematic. Yeah, uh, it might be for you better given the what has happened in the last four years. There you go. Yeah. Yes, that's yours. Huh? Most okay. What aspect of Mindanao and the new Imperial Manila Davao dynamics? Your next area of exploration. Um, well, as I I haven't really explored going into the current events uh, because I'm primarily a historian of colonial uh, American Mindanao, no. And I think I would need a historical distance if, if ever I will work on a certain uh, topic. Uh, well, I do know that there's a lot of interest on uh, Davao and uh, uh, right now, but um, going into <laughs> current events, uh, I don't think I, 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 I would uh, be going there uh, at the moment. So. Yeah. So I could still explore Imperial Manila and Davao connections uh, in the early half of the 20th century, the first half of the 20th century. So, yeah, I'm a historian like Pat to Tina. What I'd be most interested in actually are the first 200 commanders of the MNLF who were sent to Libya and Asia to train in military warfare and then back. It's really an idea of the kinds of global connections Filipino Muslims had that go as far as Libya okay, in the 60s and the 70s. Uh, Eric Tagliacozzo from Cornell has already something written something about the Hajj, you know, just a couple chapters of this on the Muslim Filipino Hajj of Muslims, Filipino Muslims going to the Hajj. I'm really curious about, you know, those military commanders and also the veterans of the Afghan war, Hashim Salama, you know, uh, uh, this, uh, you know, these commanders are the heads of the MILF, fascinating people, very quite articulate. Kashim Salamat wrote a dissertation, no? But nobody studied that kind of southern connection 
because everybody is just looking at Manila Muslims. Uh, that would be fascinating to study. Now, over and above that, the kind of smuggling network that survived you know, uh, that's, uh, ch changes in state world formation since what the Spanish came. Like like the, 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 my colleague here, I really am interested in the history side of it. Not the policy, you know, I'm sorry. Okay. Anyway, ah, no more questions. Okay, uh, how do we close this? Um, okay, um, do I close it? Okay, let me close this by saying again, thank you very much for uh, those who listened to the forum, to the Canadian press, and also to both Pat and Oliver. I mean, you have no idea how much your work has given this old, you know, old foggy, the energy again to say, yeah, I can continue with this. Uh, uh, you know, I'm supposed to retire and just write a novel, a very boring novel, but reading your works and reading the works of Michael Hawkins and uh, it just gives me the, you know, the, the, the energy to say, damn it, I'm an antique, you know, they can attack me anytime they want, but, uh, you know, they like, I hope they'll, you know, make, uh, put my book in the archives not to be read again. <laughs> but it also gives you the idea like, yeah, why not, you know, last hurrah. And so thank you. Thank you really for being here. Uh, you know, uh, you've always been an inspiration for us. Oh, there's one. Uh, uh, Mr. Ol uh, Professor Oliver, may I request you to mention your viewers' purchase of the book? You yeah, were our yeah. inspiration. Uh, yes, you're 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 far too modest. Yeah, you, uh, you should be flogging. You should be flogging this book with with more vigor uh, to everybody because it's 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 a seminal text and and something that you know anybody who who has any interest in in the history of Mindanao in the 20th century needs to read uh, before anything else. I mean, it's 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 a truly seminal work. Um, so. We just want to, you know, quickly sort of point point out a signpost where where you can get this book. Um, so thanks to everybody who sent their comments and questions uh, and for taking part in, in making Mindanao 2020: The Social Origins of uh, Sep uh, Moro Separatism and Dutertismo. Uh, the book Making Mindanao by uh, Patricio and Abinalis is available during Ateneo Press's Harvest Sale at 30% off. Uh, this December 12th to 14th uh, at Lazada and December 15th at Shopee. Uh, follow Ateneo Press on Facebook, Instagram, uh, and Twitter uh, at Ateneo Press for more information. Thank you, Oliver. Oh, and then, so I guess with that, we sign off. And maybe Ateneo Press would uh, sponsor something on Oliver when the book comes out, the film edition. And with Pat, when the book finally comes out too, yeah, uh, it's really, I mean, and then may, maybe we can bring in Alisa Paredes uh, also to share with us the insights on Davao bananas in Japan later on. Um, I look forward to talking more with you. And in fact, I suggested some earlier that we might form an, a panel, the Association for Asian Studies in 2022, which will be in Hawaii. So the first beers are on me. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for the for the opportunity Hi, okay. to, to, yeah, spoke, to, spoke, to speak with thank both you. of you. Thank you very much. Okay, we're done. <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> How do we ask him to come back? <laughs> uh, here, let me send. Let me send a, a quick, a quick email to him. <laughs> so we just stopped the live already. <laughs>